Once there was a guy called Jacob, and Jacob lived in a small house in a peaceful country with his two brothers and his father. And Jacob needed to take care of the cows. So every day he went to the meadow fields, bringing the cows there, to eating grass, and he was sitting under a tree, just waiting there till it was night and getting back home. He did it every day, again and again. But sometimes there was danger. A bear appeared, trying to eat one of his cows. And then he grabbed his sling, grabbed a stone, and he killed the bear. Just one throw. He was so good at it. But sometime there was war in the country where Jacob lived in, and two of his brothers were sent to the battlefield. They never returned. They died, killed in action. Then Jacob wants to go to the battlefield as well, and he asks his father, "I want to go there." And his father says, "But if you can't come back, I'm alone with the cows." He said, "I will come back. Don't worry." So Jacob went to the battlefield, and when he arrived, he saw a huge army. But it wasn't at all. There was also a sort of a special weapon—a giant walking there, intimidating the whole army of Jacob. And Jacob went to this general. He said, "Let me fight." He said, "You, you're just a kid. Go away. You make a laugh of this." Then the giant walked there, saying, "Send me one man to fight with. If I win, you all get my slaves. But if I lose, we will be your slaves." And then Jacob asked his general again, "Let me fight with him. I'm not afraid. I will kill him." And he said, "All right, just go there. Kill yourself." So Jacob enters the battlefield, and the giant was walking there. He said, "You and he fight with you? Go away! I'm not going to fight with a kid." Jacob walked there, facing the giant. He said, "Giant, I'm not afraid of you. I will kill you." And the giant turned it around, wrapped his sword, walked to Jacob, wanted to crush him. But Jacob was very fast. He moved, grabbed his sling, grabbed a stone, killed him. A stone hit his head. He fell on the ground, broke his neck. Jacob became a hero. Jacob was creative because he was so used with his sling. He could kill the giant easily. But Jacob is sort of a metaphor. Of course, Jacob can be anyone, anything. Jacob can be an impressive artist, making amazing art, like Rembrandt, doing things a little bit different, becoming a huge master. But Jacob can also be an indie company, with just a couple of artists, developers. Creating one of the biggest games in the world, Mojang, created Minecraft. Can also be software, open source software, creating free software for everyone, becoming one of the biggest players in the world, Blender. They share one thing, and that is extraordinary use of creativity. They're doing that in a very smart way, and making the difference. That's a great thing. Think about it. Creativity. What is it? It's such a complex thing. The sort of a chemistry in our head, what makes us make amazing things. It's not always there. Sometimes, when you are in a good flow, and you like the,、uh, starting the day and create beautiful things, but sometimes it isn't there. You want it, but it's just you're losing it. It's sort of a sixth sense. Yesterday, I had a dream, and I dreamed about something that happens a long time ago, and it was combining with something I had earlier that day, and it makes a sort of a story that was right. Creativity, creativity in your head—it's so beautiful. I love it. It fascinates me. 
and trying to understand what it is. Or does somebody in this room knows what it is? Come join me and tell me exactly. I just really want to know it, I'm trying to unveil it. My first experience with creativity was 10 years ago. I was in a room with all sort of paintings, but there was one painting that was attracting me and was facing that painting. And I walked closer and it was really fading in that image, really an invitable world. It was so beautiful and in flashes, I was there. It was just a painting, a flat canvas, but it did magically things with me. Again, my brain did something with chemistry and I joined it. I thought, this is sort of magic. I love that. And when I went home and were thinking about this, I thought, you know, one day I want to be as that artist, being so good, creating something really special. I want to become one of that. And I started using 3D software because I thought I can use oil on canvas, creating oil paintings, but I want to do something new, something from this age with modern technology. I started creating paintings like this. And if I watch it nowadays, I think these are silly images. But then when I started creating these, I loved it. I thought I can create my own worlds. That's so cool. And start doing it again and again. And over the years, I learned new things, new methods to improve my worlds. And that's great, you know, when you see development in your scene, and it's not always the same. Creativity joins you, helping you to improve your scenes. That's a sort of a great process. It helps you to keep on working on it. And over the years, I, I worked on it again and again, and someone came to me and said, you like to expose your work. So you make digital works, digital artworks. We put them on 3D televisions. So you can, oh, that's one slide too fast. Yeah, go back. Yeah, that's me. So you can expose your work on 3D televisions and uh, so people can see it. And we did, we launched the Golden Age 3D and people went there and they gave me feedback about my worlds I created. It motivated me again so I could improve it and work on it. And after the Golden Age 3D, I started the Golden Age Experience as a project where I started to make movie sequence. I wanted to make a 3D movie. And I worked one year on it, and then something happened. I got in contact with VR. It's me working on it. And when I get in contact with VR, something changed. Something changed inside me. I was so amazed that I was in a room with just a cube. I could move around and things were moving real time. Something explodes inside me. For some reason, I wanted to change all these artworks in real time worlds. I'm really obsessed about it. And I went to my client and said, we should go make this into VR. And he said, oh, yes, I like it. Just try it out. And I worked one more year on it. And I had so much struggle. I worked in a small group of artists, character artists, environment people, making assets. And I, I didn't have any experience with game engines. But for some reason, I wanted to make this happen. Technology to part of me. And I was fading away, creating my... CG scenes. It must be real time. And in the end of 2014, we released the Golden Age VR on 32 VR machines. Should be a great success. We had news articles and newspapers and television, and a lot of people were talking about it. It should be a success, but it didn't feel right. The technology changed my focus. The goal I said that I wanted to make beautiful CG scenes was far away. I was remembering I was in that room with a painting. It was impressing me so much. And this was what it was right now, a real-time scene. And I didn't want to do that. So I thought, you know, I dropped this whole VR process. Just get away. I wanted my focus back again and create worlds that I want to create. 
improving my CG art. But the big question was, how? How can I do this? It's really easy to say, oh, I'm going to improve it. But, uh, but how? So I went outside, out of my cave, going to new cities in Holland, studying, making photographs, really trying to understand this, 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 this world that I wanted to create. And then I went back home and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I will start a class. I will, start blend, I will teach Blender users how to create environments. So all the things I learned, stealed, I wouldn't learn that and teach them creating 3D environments. So I teach them how to create buildings, how to work with notes, materials, work with lighting, atmosphere. But I wanted to do one special thing, something different. The final chapter should show the creative process, showing the little bit of creativity and the magic, what, what sometimes happens when you're doing the right thing and you create the scene. So I had to capture five more lectures, and I was putting everything together, and I created this scene, and I was watching it, and I thought, no, this is what I am always doing. I'm always creating these kind of images, and I want to do it different. I want to make a new step. And I thought I learned it by, uh, by learning myself new methods, but it was just this. And I thought, this is not an invitable image. It's just this. So I thought, no, this is not going to be the thing I want to create. I thought, I need to clear my mind, having a break, doing something different. For years, I was only working on VR stuff, CG works, improving myself, improving, but I needed to take a break. I never did that. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I will call my brothers. We go on a short vacation to Scotland, because it's always raining there. And was unprepared. We should go there for two weeks, just hiking around, where there was storm, like thunderstorm, breaking me. I was getting depressed. I was like, I was sleeping in wet, wet tents, and was, oh, it was horrible. I was just broken. I was dying there. So after eight days, I thought, okay, it was worth it, but we should go back home. And we did. We went back to the Netherlands. And um, yeah, it was, when I was back, I opened my mailbox, reading everything, and then I saw an invitation. I thought, oh, that's great. What is it all about? It was an invitation for an exposition. An exposition about my favorite environment master, and they collected all of his work, and they called the exposition Through the Eye of the Master. I thought, this is great. So cool. So I went there, and what I did, I collected all of his work in one building by time. So in every room, you could see his development, the first artworks, his first creations. It was so interesting seeing everything he did till he died. He became 80 years old. He never stopped working. But then I entered the room, and I saw two sort of paintings, one sketch and one final artwork. And when I was looking at it, this was just a sketch he created when he went to a, when a scene and created a sketch. It could be a photograph, but it wasn't yet there. And he created this. And then back in his room where he created paintings, he started removing stuff, adding characters, new props, new stuff, new lighting. Everything needed to change to he created the perfect world. He created the perfect illusion. It was just right. It was an invitable world, a world where you could join. And there were more samples like this one. And the more I was watching these worlds, I thought, it's not just about creating something, making a good composition, but the world needs to be the perfect illusion. So if I can take just a little bit of that, and chasing my seen in the final chapter, where I had so much struggle with, I think it maybe will work out and can finalize this, this course and putting it online. I was watching it, I thought, okay, I record this, and I want to just record the creative process right now. And I moved stuff, I added some stuff, 
So I thought, yes, now it's right, and we make a render. And when I was watching it, I thought, yes, it's just a bit close to the perfect illusion. This is what I want to show people who want to learn creating environments. There is something of a creative process in this, of the perfect illusion. But it's now time to keep continue working. New experiments. It's not about creating a new successful scene that people like, but trying things out, making mistakes, that's not a problem. So using the same setting with just different buildings, just change stuff, uh, a new city scene to see what happens with volumetrics and, and sunlight. And after a couple of experiments, I thought, okay, I think I get used to this, creating the perfect illusion. It's just a matter of working more and more and more to get better at this. But I want to do now something special. You know what I would do? I use concept art of my favorite environment master. And I would like to make a transition of this to a digital artwork. So this artwork was good. I mean, he did just the right things. And um, so I thought, I want to change this. And I worked on it, and I created Germania. And Germania became one of my popular artworks. Uh, and that was great. I mean, it was featured on ArtStation and in the gallery of um, 3D Artist Magazine. And even my cat liked it. And I thought, yeah, now we're getting a little bit more to the core. And if I'm looking at myself thinking, where, where am I now in this creative process? I think I'm just starting. I'm 30 years old. But I feel like I can learn so many new things. It's a big adventure. And I love that. And these people, environment artists, they started to make the most impressive work, the masterpieces, in an age of 50 years old. After having a lot of experience creating hundreds of artworks, they're starting to make these brilliant artworks. That's impressive. You need all these years. And of course, if you are very, very talented, you can create beautiful things. But the more you do, you will create magic in the end. But 3D artworks are not all paintings. That's something I had to think about. What I'm doing, or what we do, is we create an artwork and posting that online, or we put it in a frame and putting it on the wall. But we're now living in an age where a cool things, new technology is appearing, like virtual reality. And I think we need to think about this, finding new ways to, to show our world, to make that, that world that people like to join. And I think if we are all just be a little bit like Jacob, entering the battlefield, starting a project, starting something creative, fighting the giant, using your creativity to make something extraordinary. Or the general of the army saying, go kill yourself. The people were saying, it's not going to work out. You start something. and Try to make something, and that will work out. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.